You want to put it right as close to the middle, just right in the V of your t-shirt would be perfect. Yeah, and you can do it like that, and then you can go ahead and clip it. And once it's clipped, you can actually, you should be able to turn it. I have never used one of these. Okay, it's not. Let's try this again. But this is where we want to do it. We want to do it. There. Okay. okay. Yeah, and this can go in a pocket. Sweet. So. And I have somehow managed to lose oh. the display. Okay, I'll just take them. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> um, that should be. Should be. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sweet. Cool. So today I am the unlucky victim of the first presentation. So one of the things I'm mostly interested in, especially when it comes to computational lexical semantics, is the idea of roles, how they're quantified, how they're usable, all these things like that. So partially why I'm the first victim is because one of the first papers that we got to present is on semantic proto-roles. And so this paper was done by Reisinger et al. Um, in 2015. And the basic gist of what they're talking about is, one, can we use Dowdy semantic proto-roles um, for SRL-related tasks, and more importantly, is there a solid shortcut that we can use to get annotations for these so that we can actually do it? And the answer to both of those questions, according to them, is yes. Before moving on, I thought it was really useful to go ahead and start off with where they start off in the paper, which was representing Dowdy. And I think that they did a really clear job of explaining what Dowdy's proto-roles are, how they function, and different ways of thinking about it. So I decided we'd start off by doing a quick little visual overview as to how Dowdy actually works. So you'll notice we have three different subjects, and then ran from the staircase to the last office in the hallway. A priori, we know that there's two senses given these three different subjects. So sense one is John ran from the staircase to the last office in the hallway, which is a volitional movement frame. And we know that because John is an agent that can move. The second sense can be grouped together with Omnicorp and the bookshelf, because both of those really have to do with location. So Omnicorp ran from the staircase to the office in the hallway. OK, so they have a lot of offices in a particular building. And then the staircase ran from the last office, or ran from the staircase to the last office in the hallway. It's a really big bookshelf. But at the same time, ran in this particular instance still indicates a location and a range in which this thing operates within. Well, part of Dowdy's whole criticism of semantic roles in general is how we categorize them. And so for the first problem, if there are too few classes of thematic or semantic roles, you don't get a solid semantic representation. There's a difference between John running from the staircase to the office at the end of the hallway and Omnicorp doing it. On the flip side, though, if there are too many classes of semantic roles, you still lose the capacity to find any generalizable trends that are useful for tasks that are in computational linguistics or even just for semantic analysis in general. And so rising or at all, talk about, or continue on with the proto-roles and talk about how, one, Dowdy's semantic proto-roles moves away from using categories and looks at the inherent features of them. And so instead of saying, this is an agent, this is a patient, this is a theme, this is an experiencer. They say instead, there are these features that are inherent to these roles. And instead of looking at what class these things are in, we look at what features they have. And so it's fundamentally different. It's no longer putting things into buckets. Instead, it's saying it has this feature, it has a lot of this feature, it has this feature, it has a lot of this feature. If something thus, this allows for arguments to be attached to the verb to have a range of these features. And it's not just the predicate now. It's any argument that attaches to the verb can have any of these features shown here in table one. And so all of these can then operate according to a scalar judgment. How much volitional involvement does something have? How much does it change state? Et cetera, and so forth. And so the roles that we know 
and that we use, these classifications and these categories, are really configurations, oh, not these categories, configurations of these features. And so an agent would have everything from A through E, that would be a prototypical agent, would have strong tendencies in these characteristics. A patient would have all the protopatient characteristics, and it would be strongly correlated with all of them. So if you're on a scale for F through J, F through J for a protopatient should be, in the experiment used today, they used one through five. So on a Likert scale of one to five, all the protopatient properties should be a five. And there shouldn't be any protoagent properties if it's a protopatient, or sorry, if it's a patient. For an agent, A through E should all be a five, and there shouldn't be any protopatient properties. And then, of course, the more complicated ones, such as theme and experiencer, these have features that are combined from the both of them. So, for example, an experiencer has features B and E from protoagents and H from protopatients. And so you notice that this is a move away from the classification and now saying, hey, if it has these features, it's likely to be this role. So moving on to what Rising Urinal actually did. So we're going to talk about the experimental methods, the results, and some of the applications of what they were talking about. So for some preliminary questions, can proto-role labeling be crowdsourced? Two, how can this be useful for current annotation tasks out there? Three, would proto-role labeling be scalable? Four, do the results confirm Dowdy's hypothesis? And five, how do these fine-grained, multivariable results compare to other SRL databases? And can they be combined? Which is one of the central questions of the paper. So experimental methods. Step one, generate a series of judgment questions using the Likert scale in order to generate scalar judgments. This is framed in things such as, how likely or unlikely is it that the argument that we're curious about caused the predicate, or the event in this instance, to happen? How likely or unlikely is it that the arg chose to be involved in the predicate, which is obviously testing volition? How likely or unlikely is it that arg changed possession during the predicate? One was very unlikely, five was very likely. Next, and here's their cheat. This is their hack for getting as, much, as many annotations as they possibly could. They took these questions, they took sample sentences, and they put them on Mechanical Turk. And they said, hey, we don't really want to pay like an annotator, which is going to be super pricey to do this. But it's like five cents per question on Mechanical Turk to get someone to go ahead and give us some decent annotations. Let's do that. And so they really did this in two experiments. They did an experiment one, in which they used sentences and nonce words. So utter ran random nonsense words. And the second experiment, in which they used corpus sentences. These are real live dead sentences that someone wrote down, whether it came from the internet or somewhere else, an actual sentence. And so an example of experiment one would be, the Negler killed the Bogrub. And then the question attached to it would be, how likely or unlikely is it that the Bogrub was altered in the above sentence? Now, I didn't put everything on there because they asked all of their scalar questions per example. But as an example as to how this might look with a single question, there you go. You'll notice that Negler and Bogrub are not words that exist in English. I highly doubt that they exist in any language. But what's important is where they're positioned in the sentence and what verb is there also. And so they tested to see if there was an interaction of the syntactic slash templatic slash profiled role, choose whatever linguistic term you want to use here, with the semantic understanding of the lexical units. In other words, for Bogrub, because it's in the object in this particular sentence, how likely is it that it's going to have the features we previously talked about? And so some of the results seem to prove similar to another experiment that was run in 2006 by Kako, which is to say, subjects are more likely to have proto-agent properties, though precisely which properties did vary according to their experiment. 
an object is more likely to have proto-patient properties associated to it. This makes inherent sense. Whenever we listen to something in this way, or whenever we listen to a sentence, or whenever we read a sentence, we make these assumptions anyways. As linguists, as computational scientists, we know that that's the way that it should be. But it needs to be verified first. And so in experiment two, they took actual corpus sentences, such as he earned a master's degree in architecture from Yale, and then asked, how likely slash unlikely is it that a master's degree in architecture was transferred? Again, testing one of those features. And of course, they used all the different questions for it. And so this tested the efficacy of the approach to annotating real live dead sentences. What they did is they found in experiment one that this was viable. It coincided with a lot of what Dowdy was talking about and coincided with previous research. But this experiment is really the creme de la creme. This is where they put their time, their love, their energy, their blood, sweat, and tears. Because they wanted to know whether or not these mechanical Turk annotators could then take corpus sentences and annotate them reliably. So it tests the efficacy of the approach of annotating these sentences. The sentences were actually pulled from a project here called PropBank. And so this is good because they were already labeled for their semantic roles, which gave them the capacity to test them after the fact. Or test them against the semantic role labels that pre-existed for them. And so some of the results with the best annotator from this particular study, they had a Kappa score, which is the measurement of the agreement between annotators in a corpus, with the, one of the authors of the paper, a 0.619, which is insanely high. They had a Kappa score with one of their English as a second language colleagues of 0.479, really, really high. And then a Kappa score with some of the non-investigators in the department of 0.594 and 0.642. So what this indicates to us is that this methodology for annotation was good enough to get a high inner annotator, inner annotator agreement between the people who were doing the annotations on Mechanical Turk and actual linguists and annotators and people who do linguistic work professionally. It was effective. And so next up, let's talk a little bit about the granularity of the data that they collected. So let's talk about some of the predictions that start off from Dowdy's proto rules. We would assume from Dowdy's proto rules that there should be a ZIF-like distribution of a few large clusters of some features, such as what your proto patient, what your proto agents are, and what your or your prototypical agents and what your prototypical patients are and lots of smaller configurations extending outwards. And so you end up having a nice zip-like tail. Oh, I should do the opposite way. Zip-like tail of a bunch of examples that have some of these features, but aren't prototypically in one cluster or another. And very few examples on one side that have a lot of these features and are the prototypical examples. It's a prediction that you would make from, from Dowdy's hypothesis, which is what they found. And so they found that while, yes, a lot of the roles that people were labeling, a lot of the features they were putting onto these arguments did indicate that it was a proto-agent or a proto-patient, the configurations, even within frames, varied quite a lot. And so they took that to mean that there were multiple kinds of proto-agents and multiple kinds of proto-patients, even within the same semantic frame. Furthermore, this was confounded by the fact that there was an interaction of noun semantics. The subject of kill is always an instigator, and sometimes, that should be the object, the object need not cease to exist. And so, for an example of this, think about, man, that class was really killing me the other day. Nothing about that class can actually kill me. It doesn't have arms, it doesn't have legs, it doesn't have volition, it has none of that. And so what ends up happening is you get these weird configurations depending on the noun and the noun semantics. And though, yes, it'll have some sort of proto-agent properties because of the fact that it's in the subject, it won't have all the proto-agent properties that would typically be associated with the subject of kill. And so yet again, we see that we should be getting that nice zip tail right there. Because while some things that are going to be more common with kill are going to be highly clustered as proto-agents, a lot of them are going to have like one or two of those features. 
and not a five on those features by any stretch of the imagination either. Same thing goes with the object in this case. I was really killing it yesterday. One, what does it mean? But two, whatever it is, that activity, is still going to be there when I come back to it some other day. So in all, the fine-grained features yield a lot of possible smaller buckets for the semantic rules that are largely ignored or glossed over simply because of the constraints of other annotation methods. When you only have so many buckets to throw something into, it's really hard to get all the fine-grained details that you would put into it. But when you're looking at the features of objects as opposed to what class that they fall into, it's much easier to see distributions of objects across the different features that you have. And so, yeah, you know what? It affirms Dowdy's hypothesis, and there's a lot of fine-grained detail that's within it, which is exactly what Dowdy would predict. And so that leads us to alignment with some of the previous SRL annotation databases. Sorry, I'm a little tired. My coffee's over there. Um, SRL data, annotation databases, thank you so much. I'm pretty sure it's a placebo. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I have blood that is coffee. Um, so alignment with VerbNet. That was like their big sort of alignment they were caring about, that they cared about trying to align their annotations with, mostly because <laughs> their corpus sentences came from PropBank anyways. And so that made the most sense to go ahead and align it with VerbNet that uses PropBank for labeling its semantic, semantic features, semantic roles. So the method. They took the mean one through five of all the proto role ratings and projected it onto the VerbNet coarse grained roles. I'm going to show you a visualization of that in a couple of seconds because I know that no matter how I explain that, it's not going to be as clear cut as if I show you what it actually is. But the question is, why would they do this? So according to Reisinger et al., one, the quality of this mapping serves to verify the quality of the proto role annotations. So, mapping these things shows us that these proto role annotations are of quality, that they are useful, that they're real, essentially. And two, this alignment helps compare between coarse and fine grained role annotations. So, not only does it prove to us that we can do this and that we can get good semantic representations from the Dowdy semantic features as opposed to the rules and the buckets that they would usually fall into. But it also gives us a, the capacity to compare what sorts of things can we get from the fine grain details and what sorts of things do we get from the coarse grain buckets. And so researchers wanted to do this to be a rough, essentially to be a rough proof of concept and eventually left deeper exploration of ways of doing this sort of alignment to the future. Hint, that's a project idea. And probably a good paper that can come out of it, because I'm pretty sure everyone has their projects at this point. But this is still left wide open. And this paper's from 2015. So there's a lot of things that can be done with this particular annotation method, and more importantly, with rectifying that with other larger annotation databases like VerbNet. So, Remember I said I was going to talk about number one and show you a visualization of it? This is the visualization. And so you'll notice that for all the features that they used, so for all their questions, they projected what the mean score was for that onto that role. And so for agents, so when they took the prop bank sentence that was annotated that said that role was agent, when they combined and did the average of all the features for instigated, for all the sentences that had the agent in it, they found that there was a four, that the typical, that the typical value for instigated was 4.9. For volition, it was 4.8. For awareness, 4.9. Sentience, 4.8. So they took these features, they knew what the semantic role was supposed to be for VerbNet, because they had it from PropBank, and they just went ahead and found the mean from all the examples that they had and said, hey, this is what this should be across 
all the different annotators that we had doing this particular project off of Mechanical Turk. So I'm going to jump along, but I think that this pretty well shows you what they did and how it looks. I'm seeing eyebrows, which means probably questions. Um, I'll take questions whenever. So if someone wants a point of clarification, anything at all, I'll do it. Actually, let me clarify that because I think it is important to clarify. Is there additional chalk? Ah, thank you, thank you. For the record, I don't actually know what a grouse is. I only know that it's a bird. Eh, whatever, all humorous examples. So what they did basically was knowing that this should be agent, that this should be agent, oops, and that this should be agent. They took, they used these sentences on Mechanical Turk and had people annotate them for Zip's Law, Helen, and Doughty. Right? And so they had these features then that you see here, the instigated, the volitional, the awareness, according to how people responded to the like art scale. And so then they just took all the agents and turned that into a mean score for each one of those features. They did the same thing for, this is a terrible experiencer, for experiencers. Same thing for patients, the same thing for all of them. Make a little more sense? No, I think I'm probably misannotating that. <laughs> but the ramp, maybe? But that was maybe the car. But was that. <coughs> oh, okay, yeah. Is that what the. No, these are just made up sentences. These are not. Oh, okay. Which is why they're all infinitely more humorous. Noun phrases that, according to VerbNet, were beneficiaries portrayed any of these features to any extent. Mm -hmm. okay. So 1.0 means it has some aspect of this feature, but it's very little. 1.0 is goose egg. That's the absolute lowest that they can get on their scale. So three is sort of neutral. Three would be, eh, not really. But one is supposed to be like the opposite of the feature. Like almost a negative example in the future. I don't know how well that actually worked in practice, but I think wasn't that the instructions they gave the annotators? So, so that's one of my points of contention with the paper, actually, because what they said for the annotators, they gave you one on one side, two, three, four, five, and then on one side it was very unlikely, so not a zero value, and on the other side it was very likely, which I think would have forced a lot of annotators to see that very unlikely, not as a negative feature, but as a, a 
couldn't happen. Unlikely to happen. Not probable. In the, in the columns where there's a small number of the frequency compared to the total frequency, like they just didn't happen to ask via Mechanical Turk for that feature? Does that Wait, question make sense? Where did, oh, like, the frequency like for... In parentheses, so like... That first column, so like asset has only seven. Right. It just didn't, it never showed up. It only showed or, up in like two examples. I mean, so, so instigated has only 1,355 for uh, agent. So wh why is that number not 1,546? Is that because the, the annotator chose not to answer because they only asked that question for certain? Or, I don't know. Maybe they didn't all finish all their tasks. I haven't the slightest clue. I didn't yeah. think that... Yeah, it's, I mean, that was probably the frequency in the data, but then this is what they actually got in terms of annotations, which could, oh, you know, they did throw out some, like, didn't they throw out one of the annotators because they had such a low correlation with everybody else? So that, yeah, so what the actual data they ended up with that they did the statistics on was a little bit less than what there could have been because for various reasons, either things didn't get finished or people got thrown out. Or so that wasn't by design. Like, hypothetically, all those so. frequencies would be the same yeah. across the row. Ideally. Okay. Yeah, so did one of them goes up to 1,508. <laughs> that's why I was asking Sorry. the definition of the 1 to 5 thing. Like, if there's some does not apply or something, that's not okay. But it sounds like that's just because of the nature of the experiment and using let me say let me say something about one differently. I think it's like contraindicated. So maybe negative. I think they use the term negative, but negative is kind of confusing. But it's like five is, you know, almost certainly it's there and it seems it's expected and it makes sense in this context. Whereas one would be you wouldn't expect it in, in this context. It would be contraindicated. So it's so unlikely, so contraindicated that it's extremely unlikely. I still I think I'd still stand by my criticism of that regardless because of the terminology that they used in the survey it would make it less likely for that to be the case in the annotator's mind than it would be for the annotator to be like, it could happen. It's not a negative value. It's just not really in this instance. And I think if it could. I think it's better than but like some if other it's things. A hurricane that does something that knocks down the fence, then volitional would be a one because hurricanes can't be volitional. So that's what I mean by contraindicated. Okay, I'll see that. But yeah, I think they probably could have defined it more clearly for the annotators. I think. Before moving on, I think that's something to definitely consider then also is like how to, assuming and seeing that this is actually useful, and I do think that it is incredibly useful, the question then becomes how can you modify it to like make that a little bit easier on the annotator and make sure that you have really, really clean data in the future. <coughs> and I think that would be sort of an yeah. interesting question to ask. Yeah, there's a couple different directions you could go with this paper for a term project. That would certainly be one of them. Man, if I had funding. Um, so one of the last little things that they talk about is their application to SRL-related tasks. And so they talk about how SRL systems are trained to predict either, one, a predicate or frame-specific notion of the role, e.g., your example is FrameNet, in which Every frame has its own unique set of roles to it. There might be some overlap, but it's still unique to that particular frame. Or two, a cross-predicate shared notion of the role, which is what you get from PropBank, in which you have lots of agents, lots of themes, and these classifications are shared across all possible verbs and all crossable, possible, all crossable, all crossable frames. Um, but some of the criticisms they talk about also is that this allows for, that while one allows for fine-grained distinctions specific to a single predicate, it risks data sparsity. So you remember from that very first slide about the visual doughty? One is essentially what you get when you circle all three of those subjects and decide these are all different. <coughs> but 
two allows for sharing statistics across predicates, but requires careful manual cross predicate analysis to ensure equivalent role semantics. So it's the same as that first example, again, where you circle all of them, but someone went back and very carefully said, no, no, it's not that entire group. John is different from Omnicorp and from the bookshelf. So again, the model proposed by Rising et al. uses a feature-based model that can be applied across all predicates and most importantly across all arguments. And so it misses some of the criticisms that they put on one, essentially. Instead of it being the prediction of a specific frame semantic notion of a role or a specific predicate, this applies across all roles, all predicates, and all frames. <coughs> And lastly, as sort of an experimental proof, Rising et al. trained a log linear classifier with the data and collected simplified, and collected in simplified form, the ratings in a bucket of ones, threes, and fives. So neutral, highly correlated with this particular feature, or like has a lot of these, yeah, has a lot of this feature, and then one in this interpretation, I think, negatively correlated with this feature. So they they merged uh, two with one and four with five mm -hmm. to get because they instead of five. So, and though they didn't say what their accuracy was, which I found a little bit interesting. Quote: Even with they did, I didn't. S that was. Uh, no, let me find that. I thought I reread that section like four times. Yeah, table, test classification accuracies for each property. I missed a table, and I apologize for that. It's okay. <laughs> so. So it ranged from, uh, I mean, some of them were quite, well, you, <clears throat> but you, using, and they, they showed it with sort of very few features, and I think syntactic features, and then all the features, and with, including word vector representations. So the results ranged from the lowest was 58% for change of state, and the highest was 82.9% for instigated. Um, and I don't remember if that was that F score. Probably, probably precision. And so that's pretty good. I mean, that the instigated is similar to probably results which go from like high 70s to low 80s, depending on the data set. Um, and, and most of them are in the 70s. Whether or not something was destroyed got 82.3. That was pretty good. <laughs> that ain't bad at all. So sorry to y'all that I somehow missed that table, and sorry to the people on the line also that I somehow missed this table. Um, and so I think my time is up, but just as sort of some extensions and discussion and things that I think that are worth taking away from this paper. One, given that you've likely already chosen a project for your term paper, is there any overlap or way that this particular paper and this focus on semantic rules as a set of features as opposed to as a, a set of classes, is there any way that this can inform your project? My second question then, is it necessary to use human antiers to extrapolate these features? For example, if you have really good word vector representations, can you go ahead and find these examples from those? And then last but not least, what applications are better suited for your classic classification of semantic roles, so putting things into agent, theme, patient, et cetera, and what applications would be better served via this scalar proto-role approach? Because I think that there's reasons to use the classic version of semantic role labeling, and there's reasons to use this. And the tasks might be different. That's all I got. I think it's, we should talk about this a little bit. In particular, the last one. Um, <clears throat> because, uh, so, the, so why do we care? I mean, why did they, 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 it was a very carefully designed set of experiments they did over, uh, couple of years. You know, they put a lot of time and energy into this. So why? What's the, um, 
you know, why would you want the, these Predator features instead of just saying, yeah, this is an agent? It'll, well, it addresses the linguistic ambiguity by allowing you to like computationally form dense vectors that can be similar to each other to some extent rather than categorical type vectors where this is an agent or it's not an agent and so these things are therefore totally unrelated. Well it gives you so a more continuous representation, yeah, more continuous. distributional representation. So <clears throat> why is that? Okay, so then it lets you recognize that there are going to be some things that are um, sort of on the borderlines of being agents. Okay, so why do you care? Why is that a good thing? Well, as a what linguist. What would you do with it? Well, as a linguist. Oh, okay. All right. So go ahead and answer as a linguist. Why do you care? Well, we tried to do semantic role labeling ourselves, and it was super subjective, and it addresses that fact by saying this is sort of agent-like, but it's also sort of like this other role based on these sets of features. So it just seems more satisfying from a yeah. linguistic perspective because right. it's a better fit. It's a better fit to the data. Okay. Another thing is that if we want to uh, somehow take prop bank into consideration, then we would like to know which one is arc zero, which one is arc one. So once we know that it is proto agent and another is pro proto patient, so we can roughly map. But we've already got that. We already know which ones are arc zero and which ones are arc one, and we can do that automatically, pretty accurately. So this is this is giving us more information. It's more fine grained information. From a, now, from a practical perspective, if you're doing NLP applications, why would it be useful to have this additional information? What would it let you do? Encode sentences into a continuous space where you can more easily classify things based on their relationship, how close they are in that continuous space. Right. You could say, so you've, you had, uh, this class is killing me. And maybe there's another sentence that says, uh, watching the political shenanigans in Congress every day is killing me. Okay, And that might help you recognize that those two uses of kill are closer to each other. Because um, you'd have to recognize that by this class is killing me, you meant attending this class. So it's an event. Okay. But, um, okay, so, it, so you can fit the data better, but let's say so my application is question answering, or my application is, you know, trying to, okay, this is what we get all the time, okay, I'm an intelligence analyst uh, 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 at an intelligence agency, and I'm reading through literally thousands of documents, trying to find out how likely it is that there's going to be a rebellion in this African country where the opposition leader has just declared that he's really the president. Okay, so would it help me do that task? My answer, I think on that one is yes, because at least in some of the things that I've done, I've noticed that there is a correlation between the syntactic template and at least the polarity for what people are talking about. Um, and that I found out that doesn't carry over for an entire document, but it carries over real nicely for sentences. And so if you can take isolated sentences and figure out that this syntactic template has this particular feature and that this feature in some way, shape, or form is often correlated in other speech acts with other rebellions, then you should be able to go ahead and have a better prediction of whether or not this is going to lead to a rebellion right there. And that sort of a strategy can be better boosted by this sort of, a, by this particular by this particular methodology also, because then you now know what kind of agent, what kind of theme, what kind of patient is the government being construed in, in this particular instance. And in past speech acts, how often was it construed as that particular kind of theme prior to this violent overthrow? Okay, so you can, it can give you better fit. Again, it can give you a better fit so the ins these new instances that you're looking at in this new document, you can better fit them to instances in a previous document where maybe there was a similar situation and a rebellion did occur. Mm -hmm. So you could maybe get a better fit. Um, but do you really need to be explicit about these proto-role features to do that, or could you just use word vector representation? See, that was also the point of my second question, whether or not you might be able to get similar representations out of that, out of word feature or word vector representations. 
But I do think regardless, the same strategy applies no matter what. You still need to know what those features might look like for the proto roles. Because the proto roles, I think, have psychological reality, right? Those proto roles are attached to how we think about things. And if you're going to try and predict someone's behavior off of text, you need to know how they're encoding what they're thinking about it. And so you might be able to get the same groupings from these actors. Predict someone's behavior off of text. You mean the author's behavior? Or no, 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 no. Like, Going back, in the text? going back to the example of like, okay, we have this text of people talking about this particular event or this particular government, and like, yeah. how are they going? What's like their next step? So the government people or the opposition party people to predict their behavior? Yeah, because I think that's what you're talking about, yeah. correct? Um, Sorry, I interrupted you. It's okay. Can you get back to what you're trying to make? No, no, no. I'm trying to. It's all good. I still think that whether it's like the word vector representation, having like a representation on top of it that shows that these proto roles, that these proto roles exist is really useful. But also you can use these proto role representations to it's similar to how like they went ahead and combined it with VerbNet, right? So they had these proto role features and said, hey, all of these things like grouped into this in VerbNet. You can do the same thing, I think, with text in other domains. So if you can go ahead and figure out what the grouping is of a particular set of arguments, you can then go ahead and say this grouping really resembles a grouping that you would get from the proto rules, and so it probably shares these features. So you know what the you know what groups together as a particular kind of proto patient or a particular kind of proto agent or as the experience or whatever from like the proto the different feature configurations mm -hmm. all come under the umbrella of proto agent. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think you can use that and those features to seed what would be grouped in from your word vector representations because you can get a lot of word vector representations from a lot more text than you can get annotators to do it. Okay, so you take those little groups and you find and you get their, the word vector rep representations for those little groups and then you find other word vector representations that are in very similar semantic space and, and that sort of expands the membership in your group. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I got to that in a really convoluted way. No, no, no. That I mean, no. That was fine. Um, okay. I, so I, there, I, I want to. I was just going to say, particularly, yeah. you can do it in a way that addresses finer grain distinctions. And so you have these continuous vectors, but you have an idea that they're mapped to something that's somewhat agent-like. So if you are extracting information from a mm -hmm. text that's important to the government, like in your case. You can know particularly like this thing that's not normally an agent is being used in a somewhat agent-like way, which is something you would probably miss if you were using categorical features. And similarly, like just training unsupervised word embeddings wouldn't have any idea in what sense you're using mm -hmm. uh, the noun or a verb or whatever. And so you can get a uh, because of the I guess like the fine-grained distinctions that these features make with the goal of aligning like agentiveness and patientness um, or themeness or whatever it is um, you can you can learn more about the semantic roles of something with respect to the context or something like that mm -hmm. that's really vague but that's yeah I don't know <laughs> that's what I get anybody else questions or comments for Zach?